welcome to part two of Hank Gerritsen. I would like to start with Hank in his own words from Essay on Gardening. I have no affinity whatsoever with Baroque gardens because they are so far removed from my world of perception as expressions of an outdated world vision rooted in an unshakable belief in the superiority of human reason, they leave no room for the individual experience, let alone nature. One can also attempt to chaperone the process instead of always trying to control it. Those who stick too rigidly to a predetermined garden plan end up engaging in a time-consuming battle with nature. Those who want gardening to remain an enjoyable endeavor have to be flexible. Change is not by definition wrong. Those who allow nature to take its course may witness fantastic results, so much so that it will surpass their wildest dreams. You know, I find his book, The Essay on Gardening, to be uh, probably the best gardening book ever written. Yeah, I agree. And of course, uh, when, when his book came out in 2008, uh, when I read it, it was just everything I really know about the plants. Yes, that's, that's it, uh, what, what I always thought about. That's it, what inspires me. That's it, what the point for a real uh, naturalistic gardening. Yeah. Quite likely. I think it, <laughs> it, 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 it expanded immensely and crystallized a lot on his, on his, on his writings over the, over the past years from that first book. It's, I think it's... You said he's a visionary voice. More so now Hank. than ever. Oh, absolutely, because he he was just sort of his first book, uh, playing with nature. My God, it's got Hank's drawings and always photographs of his botanical expeditions with Anton, and and it was just so visionary. I mean, even sort of me not understanding much of the Dutch. I mean, just looking at it and get the few bits I could get out. I thought, oh my God, you know, this is the perfect book. It's more taking examples from nature and how how they they affect and how they can be reflected in, in, in what you're doing in a garden because gardens are an artificial thing. They're a process. They're something we apply in our minds to our, our, our sort of immediate landscape. And we don't have to have this huge impact. We can be just sort of liaise, playing with nature as this book. So we can liaise with nature and interplay with it. In such sort of in such sensitive and ways, I mean, we can be just like we can sort of snip things like like goats are in the in the Greek maki or something like making topiary. I think that's why Hank's topiary was so brilliant because it was so wild and, and naturalistic and, and, and crazy. When I when I saw all that, I thought, you know, my God, this this person just knows so much about nature and is just saying exactly what should be said. And if everybody listens to it, then we can all step back and stop destroying everything and just play with nature and let it, let it have its hand. But we just sort of guide it in, in gentle ways. We don't have to, it doesn't have to be a fight. Um, also, the, also the books, all the, the 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 text of the books of dream plants, etc. They're all from from Hank's pen. He was a fantastic philosopher, a fantastic uh, gardener who had his own specific way of doing certain things a certain way, because that's how it had to be done. Um, is it a positive thing or a, or a negative thing? Um, it doesn't matter. It worked, and it did all contribute to this end product of this wonderful gardening where you wouldn't notice that much that you were actually gardening. It looked like it was almost neglected. When he first talked about it, yeah, his friend Anton was died. I came in his garden, and I think it was in the 90s. 
And then on that moment, he was talking to me and showed me that he was going on with a big project for a big, huge book. He take a long time to write it. He he was make he was working on it for years and years. And I think that that is one of also the reasons that it's so good. And he had thought about so much about it. But most people, maybe you know also from your own country, they are buying books for pictures. And this is real reading book. It's interesting because he has worked for years on this book. And now we can see... After 10 years, it's still an important book. And people are uh, talking about it and saying, hey, when you say, what's an interesting uh, garden book? And then they named the book of Hank. So it's inspiring people, but you can see it's not a huge, big, short wave, but it's a, a little wave stream what's creeping on around in years and going on and going on. And this translation in English and German, and now um, they're busy with French, Spanish, and uh, Italian, that says enough. I'm, I'm so sorry for him that he didn't see that this book is so good and it will go on in the time. It's not an, an hype, it's not short, but it's... It's long and, and, and steady, and I think that's, that's good. I think it's very important to read the book of Hank and to read and, and, and read again and to realize you how the system of gardens and nature is coming together in your own garden and how it works. Read his book and find the path of harmony between a way of gardening and, and nature and plants. You've read his book, The Essay on Gardening? I have, a long time ago, I must admit. It, it's a, it's a, a very idiosyncratic book. It's uh, his idea of what a garden could be as well as being quite philosophical in that sense, it's very practical. He has his own way of, of gardening. It was highly pragmatic because he was one man maintaining a very big garden with big ideas. And if you read this, you, I think you can learn an awful lot. So um, I hope more people will read it in the future. At the time, it was very well received here and considered quite a unique um, contribution to uh, yeah, gardening literature over here, I think. Gardening is an unnatural pursuit. The gardener views nature as an abundantly filled grab bag from which he is free to select a number of items he would like to use in his garden and then dispose of the rest in the trash. But he's mistaken. Once opened, the grab bag turns out to be a Pandora's box, which constantly releases demons that besiege the gardener and his garden. That is not the kind of gardener I want it to be. In what can be described as a reversal of Beth Chatto's adage, creating a garden out of a wilderness, I have concentrated in particular on transforming a garden into a wilderness. However, this doesn't mean that I stand helplessly by and let it all just happen. Weeding manually remains an essential task, one which I don't dislike doing. Nothing is more delightful than kneeling amongst the plants and picking out seedlings at your leisure. Indeed, it's creative work. You start looking at your garden from a completely different perspective. You perceive your garden as a young child would, and your thoughts slip effortlessly back to your grandma's breathtaking garden. And then you discover that all kinds of insects live in your garden, the existence of which you had never suspected. Let's talk about 
talk a bit about the Priona Gardens. Pink Garden is and was quite unusual in that when you went there, you were often confronted by something that you didn't expect. And that might be total chaos, which you didn't understand, or it might be so sublimely beautiful that you, you were amazed uh, a garden could be so inspiring. I visited that garden probably over a period of 10 years. One day you would visit and you wouldn't think it was worth coming back again. You'd think, what is this all about? And then you would visit it on another occasion and uh, all of that would be forgotten. And you would uh, just walk around and be totally delighted that you were in that, uh, in that garden space. So you've been to his garden, Pernora Gardens, a number of times. It does seem that, that it's an important garden. I believe so, yes, yes. I mean, what the garden shows was that a garden can actually be a work of art for an artist to express themselves, and in this, in this case, through the creation of a garden. And it was totally the man himself that could make it, and no one else could have made that garden. <laughs> Maybe nobody else would want to. That would be what he would look for hope as well, I think. Interestingly enough, about six months ago, which is now more than... Uh, 10 years since I was there, we actually did go back to the same garden. And I was actually quite surprised. Okay, it was October, so the garden was going to sleep. But I was quite surprised how much still of his uh, spirit was, was there to, to see and find. It was, um, it was actually well worth, uh, worthwhile. The structure is still there. And from what I could see a few months back, um, a lot of the, of the ideas are still being um, expressed in those borders. It was, it was still well worth the visit. All his inspiration came from nature, not from gardens, came from nature. He would look at a plant from, from a point of view of use in the garden rather than how different it was and how it would fit in with certain things. And if you ever come to Holland, his garden's still there which was absolutely fantastic, and certain things work and certain things don't work, but that's, that's how gardening is. You try something out and it, it works or it doesn't work, and if it doesn't work, you go and explore why not, and what can we do to which plants would be happy in these atmospheres. But what, what I experienced at Priona Gardens, every week when I came there, I found a new plant, which I never saw over there. So the diversity was enormous. And I'm a real plants man. All the plants have their place somewhere in, uh, in the garden. Hank thought about plants in compositions, in possibilities, uh, combinations. But he also accepted that plants doesn't do exactly the thing he wants them to do. He was very keen in... Uh, admitting that and especially giving the plants the, the chance to do that. That way of gardening, looking for the plants, what are they doing, what will they do, Wh which possibilities uh, they gave, reacting on that. He, he wants nature to do their own thing, uh, their own behavior in the plants and looking for that. And he was a, a very good observer. He, he demonstrated very clearly that a garden can be a work of art. It was very clear when you visited Hank's garden that this was possible because a lot of what he grew, he collected himself on his travels. And many things would be what I or you might call wild, weedy things. You didn't know what you were looking at and just simply looked at it and enjoyed it for what it was and how it was put together with other things then you could appreciate the garden for, as a work of art and not as an exercise in horticulture. And that was the um, barrier that you uh, needed to cross to be able to appreciate his work. So that really was what I hope he will be remembered for. Why do you think it's important that we remember Hank and that we should not forget him? I think he was um, revolutionary in, in the way he was thinking. In his own way, did do 
magic with with garden plants which nobody else did do at the time it is uh, one of the groundbreaking people i i think hank is is the next generation in that and pete Adolf as well um but but, but most most of the philosophy would have come from hank you as a gardener and the nature that together makes the garden i think that's uh, the message he gave me He was a man before his time. Yes, you can say before his time, but also in his time. You can also say afterwards, oh, he was a visionary, but not only. Because sometimes you think when you're a visionary, you are so lonely on the moment. But on the moment he was busy, he had also a group of people around him who understand him a little bit and who followed him. Uh, and and uh, there were long telephone sessions with, with brainstorming about philosophy of life um, um, or, or philosophy of gardening. Hank wasn't easy. He knew exactly how things were supposed to be. If that's, if that's how it's got to be, then don't take compromises. Yeah, go for it. You will end up with with the result that you should have had in the first place, but don't make compromises. He didn't. It was not easy, but um, his his thoughts were far beyond any of the other designers. If you live in Holland, he was part of what was uh, uh, and is going on here. So uh, in my mind, he isn't forgotten, but maybe in the general public's uh, awareness of what's happened in the past, yes, he probably is. Yeah, he died too young, you know, you know, too young. His, his humor, his in writing, everything was so good. But it was so to the point when you look back from uh, let's, uh, being in this time and uh, living in this time with, you know, the environment so under pressure. Then you see he was a predictor of, you know, in, in time. So telling people that it's not all about decoration. It's also fun uh, living well together and plants that are... Uh, not only uh, come from the same continent or being native, it's also about plants that, like society, you know, it's about uh, the right communities. What should we remember about Hank and why should we not forget him? Because he told us to listen and look at nature, stop fighting and to, and just to stop and actually look at what was happening with the expression of your land and your, your soil, your climate, what, what that was growing spontaneously there, and to, and to do with that. Don't impose things on things. And he, he shows us the way forward. Really, if I don't know if it's too much to say, we can probably save ourselves by going back into some form of symbiosis with nature some dialogue, with, great dialogue with nature like that. I think that's what we should remember is Hank said dialogue with nature because we are gardeners that we can see things, we, we're in physical contact with nature and we really do just have to sort of stop, unlearn and look and bluff. Open yourself up to all what's happening and go with the flow. And I think that's the main thing is to, is to stop and listen and to observe and to, and to work with what you've got. That's the great thing. And I'm sure if we did, did all that, Hank's vision could, could, could probably save us. With the way things are going, so much is, since Hank has died, the, the rate of species extinction, the, the rate of ecological collapse is becoming quite frightening since Hank died. So I think... If we if we can stop, if we can if we can take on everything that Hank says, I think we've we've got some light at the end of the tunnel. I think it's very necessary to to to, to get Hank's voice heard by as many people as possible. As I say, it's, it is a real life belt to help us sw swim because we're sinking right now. And I think we've, if we got if we got voices like that, then we certainly have a, we're in for a chance. Well, although he did most beautiful plans, I mean, his plans were sort of breathtaking. He was a real draftsman, was Hank. He could, he could draw most beautiful 
botanical portraits of plants, and his plans were just, you know, top quality, incredible. At that time already, it's not about native and non-native, it's about living well together. Insiders for people who knew Hank, everyone who, who was interested in the book liked it, but never became a sort of bestseller in, in gardening. You can imagine that when you read it. It's more philosophical. It's more about how we looked at plants. No, not every day, but uh, every few weeks, I find a new thing about uh, Hank. A little thing. We... Uh, uh, always uh, remember his ideas. There's an evolution, and they are uh, going further and further, and he was a part of that that uh, evolution, I think. He has a lot of followers. Of course, everybody is doing it their own way. That's what uh, Hank told us, but his basic ideas are still going on. Yeah. Look through your garden uh, when you have uh, read the book, and then think about what not uh, how the garden look but especially the way you are working together with the garden you are working in the garden he has his very strong opinions he was not uh, always uh, very uh, gentle in most cases he said oh no that's wrong <laughs> <But> <laughs> i did ex uh, i i accepted that of course you always was talking about about the love of plants you had something in common yeah, of course, of course. We all respected uh, his, his passion and his, his ideas. Those were his ideas. Well, as much as anything, I think he, he allowed me to do what I'd always wanted to do. It was, it was like a sort of, wow, if, if Hank can do it, and, you know, and, and do it so beautifully. That's, because I've been the same, same kind of sort of way that I came to the things was very much through wildflowers. Actual how much physical sort of influence he's had on other people, I don't know, but he, he certainly, he certainly I know him and, and Pete, they used to ring each other up practically every day and have great sort of conversations about plants and, and gardens and wild things. I mean, you know, Jardin Plume, Sylvie and Patrick Kibel, was, was a very famous and successful garden. They went to see Hank in the in the early days of, I don't know, about sort of, must have been about 15 years ago or something like that. They went there and they were very much inspired by, by Priona, what they saw there. And then uh, our colleague, Eileen, told me, you have to talk with, uh, with Hank, because Hank is ill and uh, he is looking for somebody to take over the garden. So and then uh, I went to, uh, to Hank, uh, not uh, with the idea to take over the garden, but just to ask him about everything. A year later, in 2008, we uh, moved over to uh, a place quite nearby, uh, Priona Gardens, and at that time, uh, Hank was uh, very ill, so I went up for every two or three weeks to the garden and uh, asked Hank about everything uh, he wants to tell me. I came back from England and I got home and then there was the phone call, you had to go to hospital. Uh, Hank is in hospital and he's, and he's very ill and we have to make and we have to start the... Priona Garden Foundation, and he wants me to be the the chairman. Well, I sure, sure hope that his vision, as I say, does does come to the fore, and it's it's like a it's like a life belt being thrown to to humanity. That that vision of his, it's really it's like a life belt, and we can. We can sink or swim, and, and we can certainly swim if, we, if we're wearing the, the life belt, belt of, of the sensitivity that Hank espoused. The life of Hank Gerritsen is probably destined to get only a footnote in the history of gardening when it deserves a full chapter. I hope that I have, in the words of Helene Tonkins, been able to make something nice of it.
I hope you enjoyed our tribute to Hank Gerritsen. And once again, with special thanks to Mark Brown, Gertrude Van de Cook, Helene Tonkins, Michael King, Lourdes Van Donkeler, and Pete Odoff. The readings from Essay on Gardening were done by Jamie Horton. The music was Hans Cocklesman. Hank Gerritsen is also the co-author of two other books with Pete Odoff, Dream Plants for the Natural Garden and Planting the Natural Garden. If you enjoyed this episode of Nature Revisited, please share with family, friends, and colleagues. Nature Revisited is produced by Stefan Van Orden and Charles Gagan. Please subscribe to Nature Revisited on your favorite podcast server. And if you would like to support Nature Revisited or send us your thoughts and comments, please visit NordenProductions.com. That's Norden, N-O-O-R-D-E-N Productions.com. I hope you will join us for the next edition of Nature Revisited. Until then, please remember, we are nature. Mm-hmm.